You know, Bob, one of the sad facts is that not everybody is going to get to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's true. Right. There's going to be people who are excluded, even though God loves everyone and he wants everyone to be saved and he doesn't desire anyone to perish. Not everybody will enter. And so right. the, the question is, how do you enter? Right. And and one of the big verses that people kind of point to is is in Matthew chapter 7, right? Right. Matthew seven twenty one to 23. And, uh, of course, Matthew isn't written to unbelievers to tell them how to be born again. It's written to believers to help them in their walk with Christ. But uh, when we look at Matthew 7, 21 to 23, uh, Matthew expects us to already know the message of life from John's gospel. And I think when we look at this passage, even just looking within Matthew, we can see that this isn't saying that somehow in order to get into Christ's kingdom, we've got to be good. Well, let, let's see what, what uh, Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Okay, right. this is kind of, this is a little scary, you know, because right. here's someone who's calling Jesus Lord, Lord. But they're not going to get in. Right. Now, it says not everyone. There will be some who call him Lord. Right. Believers will call him Lord. And we will enter. But the question is, what is the will of the Father in heaven in order to be guaranteed that I'm going to get into the kingdom? Right. So he continues, many will say to me in that day, many, wow, right. will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? These are amazing works. Right, and notice all three have the prepositional phrase, in your name. Right. See, in my estimation, these are, coming, these are people coming from within Christianity. Okay. Now, it's possible a Buddhist would say this, or a Hindu would say this, or an but, atheist or an agnostic, but most likely, this is people coming from within Christianity, especially since this follows Matthew seven fifteen to 20, which deals with false prophets. Right, so these are people who know Jesus, they consider Him Lord, they're doing stuff in His name, and look what else, look what Jesus says. Now, you think to yourself, okay, if you're prophesying, if you are casting out demons, if you're doing wonders, then you're a shoe in to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? And that's not right, even though we might think that. Verse 23, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Yeah, and the practicing lawlessness could probably better be translated, you who do lawlessness, right. or you who are one involved in sinful deeds, sinful actions. Right. And the point is, these people evidently believe they've really done these things. Right. Right. They think they've cast out demons, they've done wonders, they've right. prophesied, all in Jesus' name. Right. And this is, almost everybody agrees, if you look at the commentaries, this refers to the great white throne judgment. Okay. Revelation 20, 11 to 15. And yet Jesus says, I never knew you. And that's not like an omniscience. And in his omniscience, he knows everybody. But this is, this is a, a special kind of knowledge. Right. This is a personal knowledge of one who is born again. Right, he knows his sheep. Well, right. these aren't his sheep. Well, so the weird thing is, Jesus said the only people who enter are those who do the will of the Father. And then you have people doing these miraculous acts, and Jesus actually tells them to depart and calls what they did lawlessness. So what's right. going on here? Right, yeah, that's a good point, Sean. See, p many people look at this passage and say, so the key is you need to work harder. Right. You need to be more committed. Yeah, they weren't doing enough. You need enough. to be more obedient. You're not doing enough. The problem with that is these people, when they give the basis of their assurance, it's works, right? Right. But the basis of their assurance should be faith. Well, isn't the, the will of the Father doing all these good things? No, the will of the Father... Well, obviously there are some verses where you would see that reference to God's will that we would obey... But in uh, Matthew, all references to the will of the Father refer to believing in His Son. Really? Well, and, give, me, give me an example okay, of that. How about uh, Matthew 21, uh, what is it, around verse 28, I think? Here we go. The parable of the two sons. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. Okay, there's works there. Right. He answered and said, I will not, but afterwards he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second 
and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said to him, people saying to Jesus, well, the first one did. Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Now you imagine that must have caused some chagrin on the part of these legalistic Pharisees. You're telling the seminary grads that the prostitutes are going to get to heaven before you. Right? Literally, right? he's saying the harlots, the prostitutes, they're getting in. Well, how is that possible? For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. Right. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Right. So, so belief is the issue. Belief is the issue. And uh, the issue is not going into the vineyard and doing work, he's using that illustration to say, look, these tax collectors and harlots are initially people who appear to be rejecting God and rejecting uh, everything he offers. Mm -hmm. And the religious people are the ones who are saying, hey, we're all in. Right. But it turns out that the people who actually believe God when he sends his Messiah, mm -hmm. the, the Son of God, God in the flesh, the, the religious people reject him, and the non-religious people believe in him. Right, right. And so the issue is believing. And by the way, we see this same thing in John 6, 39 and 40. Maybe we should look over there. Now, I know we're going to a different book, but as I mentioned before, uh, we should be able to understand these passages in light of the promise of eternal life in John. Well, it's all Jesus' ministry, right? It's, right. Even if it's a different book, it's the right. same ministry. This is the will of the Father who sent me that... Of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Okay, so first part is the will of the Father is eternal security. Right. Once we believe, he we're will, secure he forever. He will lose nothing. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Day. So, in verse 40, he's explaining the will of him who sent me is that we believe. And, of course, that's John 5, 24 as well, right? He yeah. who hears my word and believes in him who sent me yeah. has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. So, the basic point of Matthew 7, 21 to 23, don't look to your works for assurance. That's the broad way that leads to destruction, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. The narrow way, which few find, is the faith alone way. And so if Jesus were to ask, why shall I let you into my kingdom? The answer would be, because I believe in you for the promise of everlasting life. And you guaranteed, he who believes in me has everlasting life. 